Rise from the Ashes is the fifth case in the original Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney game. It's generally considered to be at the very least good, but for example, go on the Ace Attorney subreddit and search tier list. You'll notice that the results vary from it being top tier to mid tier. In this video, I'll answer the question, how good is Rise from the Ashes really? I had it ranked number 4 in my video ranking each trilogy case, but I'll get more in depth here. Alright, so for this video I'm going to start by giving a summary for this case since you'll probably need it as this case is extremely long. Two months after the conclusion of Turnabout Goodbyes, Phoenix isn't taking on any more cases. On this fateful day, he asks himself, why do I even come to the office anymore? Just after he arrives, he meets Emma Skye, a 16 year old high school student with a love for forensics. After being mistaken for Mia Fey, Phoenix decides to take Emma's case after seeing some parallels between her and Maya. Through some simple interrogation, we find out her sister was accused of stabbing someone. We also learn that her sister was just a few years above Mia Fey in school. Now it's off to the detention center where we meet Lana Skye, chief prosecutor. Unlike any defendant before this, Lana immediately starts proclaiming herself as guilty, and we also learn about what went down in this case. The murder occurred yesterday at 5.15pm in the parking lot of the prosecutor's office. The victim was stabbed in the stomach, and while stabbing the victim, Lana accidentally cut her hand. The body was found in the trunk of a car, and there was a witness. And as if we didn't need something else piled on, the victim was a detective, Bruce Goodman. Yay. We then move around and investigate, meeting several new characters. We have Jake Marshall, a cowboy cop, Angel Starr, a glorified lunch lady who witnessed Lana stabbing the victim, and Mike Meekins, an incredibly jumpy officer. Of course, we meet some familiar characters as well, namely Edgeworth who will be prosecuting this case, and Gumshoe. Speaking of Edgeworth, the body was found in his car, and even worse than that, Emma has a massive crush on the dude, unintentionally insulting him several times to boot. Right, so we learn a lot during this investigation, and are still completely unprepared for the trial as per usual. The main takeaway in the end is that Lana had called Emma just after the murder, mentioning something about a muffler before hanging up. At the trial, things go in typical Ace Attorney fashion. Our backs are against the wall, but using the muffler conversation, we're able to prolong the trial in order to check out the muffler. Back in court, the chief of police himself, Damon Gant, appears with what was in Edgeworth's car muffler a knife with an evidence tag saying SL9. He also tells the court that another detective was murdered at the exact same time in the evidence room at the police department. This manages to net us another day. Another thing of note, the victim of this evidence room murder? Also Bruce Goodman. He was killed in two places at once. The next day of investigation is primarily focused on the evidence room murder, but we also start to learn about how everyone involved here was also involved with the SL9 incident. Back to the evidence room murder, the accused in this case is Officer Mike Meekins, someone we actually met during the first investigation. Meekins tells Wright that someone suspicious was in the evidence room, so Meekins asked for his ID card. A fight ensued where Meekins was knocked out. This was all caught on video. Investigating the evidence room murder, we find several clues, like the fact that Detective Goodman had been filing a lost item report the day of his murder. We also find a broken jar in Goodman's locker, which is missing one of its pieces. The evidence room has a large amount of blood as well. There's a bloody handprint on Gumshoe's locker that has no fingerprints. And for the final major clue, we discover another bloody handprint, bearing the prints of Jake Marshall. In the trial, we prove that the Bruce Goodman in this case was actually Officer Marshall. You see, Goodman was in charge of the SL9 incident, in which Jake Marshall's brother, Neil Marshall, a prosecutor, was killed. Jake wanted to investigate before he ran out of time so he went to the evidence room in disguise to steal the evidence. We also proved that Meekins was not, in fact, the killer. Of course, in proving that, we actually just ended up indicting our own client, as no one else could have committed the crime at this point. However, Phoenix manages to turn it around, pointing out that the handprint on Gumshoe's locker was still unidentified, and that it could not have been left by Officer Marshall. This means that there was an unidentified fourth person that entered the evidence room. This is further proven by the large amount of blood in the evidence room, Way too much blood in comparison to what should have been there from the scuffle Meekins and Marshall had. Earlier in the investigation, Marshall had given us a list of every ID number to enter the evidence room. We were able to identify three of them, but there was a fourth that could not be looked up as it belonged to an individual of a high rank, the true killer. The proceedings end up being suspended after Marshall asks Lana if she had presented fake evidence during the trial of Joe Dark, the culprit of the S Online incident, which killed his brother. She says that she had, which causes a riot in the courtroom proceedings are suspended again. 
At the start of the final investigation, we learn a bit about the SL9 incident from Emma. Joe Dark, a serial killer, had been brought in for questioning, but managed to escape from the interrogation room. He eventually ended up in Damon Gant and Lana Skye's office, where Emma Skye was. Before Dark could get to her though, Neil Marshall caught up and began a fight with Dark. Lightning strikes, the lights go out, and with another flash of lightning, Emma sees who she believes to be Dark standing over Neil Marshall with a knife. Emma ended up drawing a picture of it for the court, but it's disappeared. Through the course of the rest of the investigation, we learn even more about the participants of the SL9 incident. It becomes increasingly obvious that Gant is the true culprit behind both the murder of Detective Goodman and Prosecutor Neil Marshall, and the fact that he was the mastermind behind the evidence forgery. In Gant's office, Wright finds a cloth with a handprint on it, bearing the prints of Emma Skye. He also finds the final piece of the jar I mentioned during the evidence room murder. Wright keeps this from Emma. Gant also had the S online evidence list in his office. We finally get the truth out of Lana in the detention center. Gant ordered her to dispose of Detective Goodman's body. When she found the body, it had Joe Dark's knife in it. When she saw this, she decided to hide that knife and instead stab him with a different one, which is what Angel Starr saw. The final trial is crazy eventful. In the lobby, it appears that Edgeworth has also come to the same conclusion Phoenix had, and when Nick asks him to help him bring down Gant, Edgeworth remarks, I'll think about it, which is code for, yeah, sure, but I'm too soon to write a say it. Before the trial can start, Gant appears and says Lana wants to speak directly to the court. She once again says that she committed the crime, and when Wright objects, Lana decides to move to self-representation. Edgeworth saves the day and objects to this, absolutely roasting Gant and remarking some deal must have been struck behind the scenes to cause this sudden change in Lana. He then calls Emma Sky to the stand. Through cross-examining Emma Skye, we learned several important things. Firstly, her drawing was actually drawn on the SL9 evidence list, which Wright is in possession of. Using the drawing, Wright is able to prove that the person with the knife raised is actually Neil Marshall, and the person on the floor is Joe Dark, and the knife is actually the King of Prosecutors trophy that Neil had won earlier. We also learned that the location of this crime was different. It was originally thought to have occurred on Lana Skye's side of the office where the body was discovered, but it actually occurred on Chief Gant's side, meaning that the body was moved. The final thing we figure out, which comes into play later, is that Emma Skye shoved Neil Marshall, thinking it was Joe Dark about to stab Prosecutor Marshall. These last two clues put together bring right to the conclusion that Marshall was actually impaled on the sword belonging to a suit of armor on Gant's side, meaning that Emma Skye is the true killer. This is the reason Lana forged the evidence in the S Online incident, to protect her sister. Lana says that there is no conclusive evidence but it turns out there was a message left on the jar found in Chief Gant's office. The classic Ace Attorney bloody writing saying, Emma. Gant comes in, LOLs at Edgeworth for using fake evidence to convict Joe Dark, and the courtroom is thrown into another frenzy. Before the second session starts, Gumshoe brings Wright a book titled Evidence Law with a message from Lana saying, if you're planning to take on him, you'll need this. At this point, Edgeworth is fully on board with Phoenix and the two will work together to convict Gant. As Edgeworth is viewed as well, untrustworthy now, Phoenix will call all further witnesses. He calls Chief Gant to the stand. After some testimony, Wright manages to prove that Gant was complicit in forging the SL9 evidence. Once Wright implicates him in the murder of Detective Goodman in the evidence room, Gant uses his right as Chief of Police to not testify and hightails it the hell off the stand. The final trial session sees the return of Lana Sky to the stand. She testifies about the forgery, and Phoenix realizes that Chief Gant had gotten there before Lana did, and hid certain pieces of evidence from her. This also means that Gant could have made it look like Emma did it, making her not guilty of anything. During her next cross-examination, Lana reveals that she has a photo of Neil Marshall impaled on the armor. Wright finds it in the book she had Gumshoe give him. The photo clearly reveals where the piece of cloth with Emma's fingerprints came from. Before Lana can be cross-examined again, Gant appears and states that Wright has decisive evidence that proves who killed Neil Marshall. Wright says that he doesn't have any he can present at the moment. Gant then explains how he concealed evidence and why he did it, to control Lana, as the evidence he concealed clearly pointed to Emma as the killer. Wright then presents his decisive evidence, the piece of cloth with Emma's fingerprints. When he reveals that fact, Lana freaks out, but Wright remains calm. He then says that this proves that Prosecutor Marshall was not impaled on the sword when Gant found him. As in the photo, his vest is all bloody, even under his shirt where the vest would have been, but not the piece of cloth. Wright and Edgeworth then explain everything together. Marshall was likely knocked out by hitting the floor when Emma pushed him away. 
Gant was the only one who could have gotten to the office before everyone and impaled Marshall, then purposefully fabricated evidence to implicate Emma. In a last-ditch effort, Gant tries to say that the evidence used against him was now illegal, as Wright refused to present it earlier. Wright is having none of this, and using the evidence law book, Wright proves that it is in fact legal, defeating Gant once and for all. And everyone lives happily ever after. Well, except Lana, and Emma, and Edgeworth, and Gant. Well, okay, some of them live happily ever after. Alright, so finally. Finally, I can get into the good and the bad. I'll start off with the good, as I feel it's best to leave a sour taste in my viewers' mouths by the time they leave. Firstly, this case is a nice little self-contained story. It slots in nicely between turnabout goodbyes and the start of Justice for All. I actually prefer the reason Edgeworth leaves because of this case, to how it was originally because of turnabout goodbyes. In goodbyes, his trauma should have been resolved. He learns that he didn't kill his father, so this addition ties in way better with his character. He presented forged evidence. Sure, he didn't know that, but I can see why it affected him the way he did. Secondly, the characters. I don't like very many Ace Attorney side characters to be honest, but the ones in this case hit them straight out of the park. Jake Marshall, Angel Starr, and Mike Meekins are enjoyable at worst. The main characters in this case are fantastic. Emma is great. She fills the role that Maya left well and has a bunch of great interactions with Phoenix and Edgeworth as well. Lana Skye is the most memorable defendant not named Maya Faye or Miles Edgeworth for me. Her insistence on her guilt is something completely different from anything we've seen before this. The final thing I really like about this case is honestly just the story. Playing through it the first time, I was super invested in trying to uncover the mystery. They threw quite a few red herrings which were done well, especially the Emma Sky killed Marshall one that permeates through the tail end of this case. The final moment where Edgeworth and Nick corner Gant together is top two for me, tied with Corner and Gatto at the end of Trials and Tribulations. Alright, now I'll get into the bad. This case is really long. Like, everything takes forever to get through, and depending on who you ask, it's the longest case in the entire series. Some of the investigation segments really drag, especially on the second day. You carry a ridiculous amount of evidence as well, like 30 pieces of it, the most in the trilogy by far. Speaking of the second day, remember that Blue Badger video? The one with Meekins and Jake Marshall fighting? That section sucks, sorry. That stupid song makes me want to commit a crime. You see it over and over again a la Turnabout Serenade, and it isn't even very fun to point out the inconsistencies in the video. The worst offender of anything during a trial is easily the jar. Anyone that has played this case themselves will understand. There's a section where you need to line up a jar with a drawing, and if you don't absolutely perfect it, you will fail. I failed about 20 times myself the first time I played, and this isn't an uncommon issue. Go watch literally any YouTube video of this case, and I can guarantee you they'll all fail more than once even if they're using a guide. Oh, and something completely random, but the case art for this case sucks. Just look at it next to Turnabout Sisters and Turnabout Goodbyes. Yuck. This case definitely does have a bit of a difficulty spike, even in comparison to Turnabout Goodbyes, which for an idiot like me sucked, and I had to use a guide several times. The main thing that made me want to make this video was Phoenix's characterization in this case. This is absolutely not Ace Attorney 1 Phoenix. It's 100% post Trials and Tribulations Phoenix. He's way too confident, which is made especially apparent on the last day. This is the same guy that needed to get carried by Mia for three full games, and you mean to tell me he can solve this convoluted ass case on his own? The fact that he manages to outsmart Gant, who in my opinion might just be the smartest mastermind in the series? I could see Phoenix doing this in the gap between Trials and Tribulations and his disbarment, but not here. And canonically, in his first case after this one, he's right back to needing Mia's help to solve an objectively simpler case. Remember, this is only his fifth case ever. However, this gripe is understandable as this case was written after the conclusion of the series. In fact, I'll get into that now. Why does this case even exist? Well, the original Ace Attorney trilogy were all released on the Game Boy Advance in Japan from 2001 to 2004. When porting the games to the DS, Capcom decided to add a fifth chapter to the first game, a way to sell more copies in Japan and also showcase some of the features of the DS. For example, you use the DS's microphone to blow away fingerprint powder, and the touchscreen to spray luminol and look at evidence from different angles. This is why the gameplay has a lot of parallels to Apollo Justice. This is the only case in the original trilogy to make use of the DS's features. 
This kind of makes it feel disjointed from the rest of the games. A new player might get to Justice for All and think, hey, where are all these cool features that were in the last game? Now that you know about my own opinions regarding this case, I want you to answer the question in the comments below. How good is Rise from the Ashes, really?